So hi everyone, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Kirby Institute seminar series today. So my name is Ben Bevington. I work in the HIV Epidemiology and Prevention Program here at the Kirby Institute, and also the chair of the seminar series. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are located today, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So for me, this is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today from wherever you may be. So just some housekeeping to start off with. So the format for the seminar today will start off with a presentation and then followed by a Q&A at the end. So to ask a question, all you need to do is click on the icon with a speech bubble and a question mark in the top right um, of your um, Teams, and then that will open up the Q&A chat panel. <coughs> Excuse me. And when you click on ask a question, please remember to write your name um, because this helps us to reference your question and make answering just a little bit easier. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who will be known to many of you here. So Professor Martin Holt is a social scientist and public health researcher who's worked at the Centre for Social Research and Health at UNSW uh, since 2003, specialising in HIV prevention research with gay and bisexual men. And he leads the Gay Community Periodic Surveys which is a behavioural surveillance system conducted in seven Australian states and territories. And so Martin is one of uh, HIV Epidemiology and Prevention Program's key collaborators and is involved in just about all of our projects that focus on behaviour and gay and bisexual men. I think I probably share maybe 99% of my uh, publications are co-authored with Martin. So in particular, it's really exciting for me that Martin will be speaking on the Gay Community Periodic Surveys today. This project is possibly one of the longest running collaborations between our two centres, um, which is the Centre for Social Research Health and the Kirby Institute, starting all the way back in 1996, and it's run every year since then. Um, and Martin took over at a certain point, and then I came onto the team a little bit later. Um, and so there's always uh, sort of half of the investigator team from the Kirby and then half from uh, Centre for Social Research and Health, and it's coordinated by Martin's team at uh, the centre. And I'm sure he'll give a little bit of a background on the JCPS for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So thank you very much and please welcome Martin Holt. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thank you for having me at the Kirby Institute uh, seminar series. It's a while since I've done a presentation here. OK, so I'm hoping you can see my slides. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to get into a presentation and it'll be based on the periodic surveys and thinking about COVID-19, which for some of us in lockdown in Sydney um, is a little bit too close to home at the moment. Um, on top of what Ben said, Ben is obviously a member of the team. Um, I know two of my uh, other team members, Curtis and Tim, are online as well and available to answer questions. And I'd also like to acknowledge Lamine and Garrick from the Centre and from the Kirby as well, who are long-standing periodic survey team members. And today I'm speaking from Gadigal land, and I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. OK, so first I thought I might just do a brief primer on behavioural surveillance, one slide, which is uh, in case this, the term gets bandied around a bit. And uh, for those of you who work in various forms of the health system or community practice and education, it may not be entirely um, familiar what this is supposed to do. Basically, behavioural surveillance is internationally recognised as important, particularly in the HIV uh, response, but also in sexual health. It's supposed to involve the, regu the regular collection of data about behaviour that affects the transmission of HIV and STIs. Um, somewhere like Australia, where the HIV epidemic is concentrated, um, this, it's recommended that the system is aimed at those populations most at risk. And historically, that has been the game by sexual men. So the periodic surveys, which we'll be talking about, um, has traditionally um, first targeted gay men, and now we're trying to do a better job, um, including bisexual men. That might be something for discussion at the end. Um, however, um, over the course of the HIV epidemic, um, very few countries have sustained regular behavioural surveillance. So Australia's in a kind of slightly unique position in the sense that we actually collect data every year from our primary HIV affected population. Um, my colleague, uh, our colleague Peter Saxton from New Zealand made the keen observation that uh, behavioural surveillance is used for a variety of um, things. It can be used as an early warning system to identify risks that we need to respond to. Um, it's often used for evaluation to see how well we're doing in responding to the epidemic. 
um, encouraging things like testing, treatment, prevention. Uh, and we often use it to try and understand uh, what um, retrospectively uh, why trends in incidents and infections have occurred. Uh, one of the key challenges, because it's a repeated system where you try to engage the same population over time, but it's not a cohort study, you know, we're kind of going back out into the community or the population to try and find out what's going on, is to try to respond to changes in practice, and COVID is a key example, um, and epidemic conditions in the HIV and STI epidemics, while also maintaining sufficient continuity over time that we can report the trends and the indicators that people want to see. And we are very much wrestling with that at the moment during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. OK, so the periodic surveys, Ben's already mentioned them. Uh, they're repeated behavioural surveillance of gay and bisexual men. Uh, uh, they're typically timed to coincide with LGBTQ festival periods, so Mardi Gras or Midsummer, Spring Out, um, you know, the various festivals that occur at different points around the country. Um, and that's because there's a lot of people out about historically, and therefore we can recruit uh, a lot of gay and bisexual men at, at, uh, in a short period of time, traditionally. Uh, we ask participants to complete a questionnaire themselves on HIV and sexual health related behaviour. It contains a lot of sexually explicit and personal material about sex, relationships, drug use and um, health service engagement. And it, the surveys are currently conducted every one or two years um, in seven states and territories. And we're in our 25th year of running at the moment, which can make us all feel old, particularly me. Um, the traditional method of recruitment um, is at venues and events uh, led by um, trained peers who we these days ask our community organisation partners, so AFEO and NAPWA members to appoint a team uh, to go out into venues and events and recruit gay and bisexual men. Um, for the last seven years, we've supplemented this by online uh, recruitment and the backbone of which has generally been Facebook advertising because it's easier to organise and it's relative, relatively economical. Uh, there's a wide range in the samples we get from the different states and territories from as small as 200 in the smaller jurisdictions up to over 3000 in the larger ones. And nationally each year we typically have over 8000 participants so it's a pretty large source of detailed behavioural data. Okay, and so we can feel a little bit nostalgic, particularly at the moment while I'm stuck in my study, which I seem to be spending a lot of time in at the moment. On the left hand side are some images from our colleagues in Victoria and New South Wales about how uh, recruitment was traditionally conducted. Um, so it's pretty old school, uh, paper and pencil questionnaires on clipboards. You can see some of our glamorous peers there and participants. Um, and, and preferably in good weather when these pictures were taken. And on the right hand side, an example of an advert that we used in New South Wales recently when we had to take recruitment online. And I'll just talk about that a little bit more. OK, so what happened last? So I'll be talking about last year into this year primarily, but showing you a few years back as well. So you can see what uh, preceded COVID-19. At the beginning of last year, we completed two of our largest uh, recruitment rounds, Melbourne and Sydney, and then COVID-19 emerged. Uh, restrictions were imposed, most of the country went into a lockdown, um, and then ju various jurisdictions started to emerge from restrictions at various points. Victoria got stuck in restrictions for quite a while. Uh, in that gap, um, after the first quarter of 2020, we made a number of adjustments to the system. Uh, so we consulted with our community partners and uh, particularly health departments about what was permissible in its jurisdiction to remain COVID safe. We added some questions about COVID-19 to the questionnaire. I'll show you the answers to those in a second. Uh, and then we had to adapt recruitment locally in the uh, five rounds you can see there that we've conduct conducted post-COVID. Now in most cases, the majority of recruitment was online. Um, so we used our Facebook backbone and it was supplemented by advertising on dating um, sites and apps um, where we had the capacity to do that and that was mainly in New South Wales and Victoria in the most recent rounds. Um, Facebook advertising uh, Tim who's online drove from CSRH. Um, 
if venues were still open, but we weren't allowed to go there to do recruitment, we uh, often asked our partners to design and put up posters with QR codes linking to the online questionnaire. And there was one um, exception here, which was South Australia, where restrictions have been lifted. Recruitment was permissible. The team led by Samesh went out to start recruitment and they're in venues and events. Um, and then restrictions were reimposed and we had to switch the whole thing online in the middle of recruitment, which was a little bit stressful. Anyway, we have now since, let's just to underscore that there is a, a mixture of things that we've done, uh, but we have successfully completed five recruitment rounds um, since COVID emerged. And we'll be doing some later this year. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is some of, as I mentioned, some of the time period immediately preceding COVID and what's happened since. Uh, it's five of the seven jurisdictions because we haven't done two, we haven't done recruitment in two in the ACT and WA yet uh, post COVID. Uh, I'm going to consider or highlight some of the effects on sampling of the changes to the recruitment method and then a sort of limited set of key indicators focusing on things related to the national HIV strategy, testing treatment, PrEP, and high risk sex. Um, Curtis uh, was particularly instrumental here in helping me look at the trends by jurisdiction, which I'll, I'm going to show you, the, show you them separately by jurisdiction because there's quite a bit of variation. Um, and then we had a look to see whether any COVID related changes were affected by age, particularly if they were concentrated among younger men, country of birth, were they concentrated among Asian born um, participants, uh, suburbs where there are higher or lower proportions of gay residents, which we know has played a role particularly in PrEP rollout recently, and whether participants who identified as gay, um, whether their behaviour was different from those who identified as bisexual or had other sexual identities as well. I'm not going to show you all of those because that's a lot of stratifications, but I'm going to highlight some where there are some interesting disparities. OK, so some data. Um, the first thing to note is that the main the effect of COVID and primarily switching to online recruitment depressed the sample size, particular, particularly in the larger um, jurisdictions where we get big samples. So you can see New South Wales on the left and Victoria on the right. Um, we can typically achieve uh, samples of over 3000 uh, participants with uh, a backbone of face to face recruitment supplemented by online advertising. Uh, and th that, those are pretty large samples recruited in a relatively short period of time, usually two weeks. Queensland's reasonably sizable as well. And you can see the switch to online advertising in most places meant that the sample size um, was decreased by a third to a quarter to a third. South Australia and Tasmania are smaller rounds and Tasmania is entirely done online and you can see there's very little difference there between 2018 and 2020 when the last uh, round was done and South Australia a bit of a drop as we switched to online mid round. So this is something to bear in mind. People often think that online advertising is more efficient and can get bigger numbers of people more quickly. It isn't true for gay and bisexual men, particularly when you're working with effective community organisations who have good outreach systems. What are some of the changes? So I apologise for the sea of um, percentages here, but this is just to note that obviously if you change your recruitment method and your advertising method, you get changes in the sample profile and we have to sort of bear these in mind when looking at the indicators. So there's not just changes due to COVID on behaviour, there's also changes to sampling due to COVID. Um, so you can see the jurisdictions here. Uh, this is the proportion recru recruited online. You can see in most cases it went up to nearly 100%. Uh, South Australia's um, proportion recruited online doubled, but isn't, uh, but wasn't 100%. Um, this is keeping an eye on sort of priority populations in the current um, HIV response. You can see in most cases we managed to sustain uh, participation of younger people. Another misconception is that online advertising is really good for recruiting younger people. But actually Facebook in particular is an aging platform, so it requires quite a bit of finesse to sustain uh, the recruitment of younger people. Um, and we had a bit of a drop in Victoria, but in general, generally it was OK. Um, Asian born participants, uh, we can calculate this here because we changed the questionnaire a few years ago to make sure we could identify uh, participants who were born overseas. 
you can see here we actually do quite well in New South Wales. We ran some advertising in language, uh, languages other than English, and boosted the participation of Asian-born men. But in the other two states, you can see a bit of a drop. Um, obviously, switching from face-to-face -face recruitment, mainly in cities, to statewide online advertising, the proportion recruited in the capital city or metropolitan area generally fell. Um, recruitment of bisexual participants went up quite markedly as well, um, increasing the geographical spread um, through online advertising. And we were actually relatively pleased because this was a concern that positive HIV positive participants um, might be less well engaged uh, with online advertising, but actually in a couple in um, Victoria, we managed to increase participation, sustain it, uh, and in New South Wales, and we, we had a bit of a small fall in Queensland. But in general, pos positive men continued to participate. Okay, and this is just graphically showing you the big jump in bisexual participants uh, as a result of the switch in recruitment method. And I'll show you something related to them a bit later on. OK, so what were the uh, various effects of COVID-19 that the participants told us about? Um, over a quarter had lost income or their job because of COVID-19. Most were practicing some form of physical distancing. Um, there were widely varying levels of testing for COVID. So a quarter in Tasmania up to over 60% of Victoria, which at the time was probably the most COVID affected round maybe doing a run for your money in New South Wales, I think, um, after this current period. Um, about half the participants said they had reduced the number of male sex partners they'd had. And that's pretty consistent with what we've seen in Flux, which uh, many of you will realise has been uh, monitoring COVID uh, on a weekly and monthly basis uh, since COVID struck and very um, clearly demonstrated how much gay and bisexual men had reduced the amount of sex they were having particularly during restriction periods. Among PrEP users, um, we found that the majority of PrEP users in New South Wales, for example, reduced their, their use, but most didn't stop. Um, conversely, one in five PrEP users in Tasmania did actually stop PrEP use. Uh, so there's kind of a range of effects going on there, and this will feed through into the indicators I'm going to show you next. So moving into the key indicators. So this is uh, a traditional one looking at HIV testing in the last year, as you might expect. Um, this is the pre-COVID period and the post-COVID period is, high, is highlighted in grey and you can see in all jurisdictions HIV testing fell um, in the post-COVID rounds, which you'd expect because you'd expect people to be staying away from health services and also they've told us they're not having as much sex. This is a bit more finessed. This is looking at higher frequency testing, which many of you will realise is uh, recommended for most sexually active gay and bisexual men, but particularly people on PrEP. And you can see here in the pre-COVID period that high frequency testing was rising, particularly in the eastern, uh, the eastern mainland states, and then it fell quite markedly. In Queensland, you can see here that's the, um, you can see the quarters, uh, the uh, quarters of the year down here. And so in the uh, second half of 2020, when the Queensland survey was run, you can see this massive fall in high frequency, uh, high frequency HIV testing and fairly substantial falls in New South Wales and Victoria. It was higher frequency testing was less likely in South Australia and Tasmania, but it still fell. Okay, so these are some of the a couple of stratifications. So this is showing high frequency testing in the three eastern uh, mainland states by age. And the younger men are shown in the dotted lines under 25, older men in the solid lines. You can see here that higher frequency testing was less likely among um, under 25s, but it fell even more among them in the COVID period. This is by country of birth. Uh, comparing Asian born men and Australian born men in the same three states. So apologies for the smaller jurisdictions here. In some cases, the change wasn't that obvious or the sample size was too small to show that. Um, and you can see here, um, Asian born men are in the dotted line and Australian born in the solid lines. For New South Wales and Victoria, not much of a difference uh, in the sample, which I guess is good, even though it fell. But in Queensland, a kind of a um, 
a, a stable kind of disparity, if you want to call it that, a big gap between Asian-born and Australian-born men in terms of high frequency testing, and the fall is uh, roughly similar. One of the good news stories um, is that HIV treatment among HIV positive participants in all jurisdictions was sustained at a very high level at around 95%. Uh, so nothing to see here, and this is consistent with what we've seen in um, clinical and cohort studies across the country, so that's good. PrEP use. Okay, so this is among HIV negative and untested men, that's the denominator. This is um, uh, any prescribed PrEP use in the last six months. Obviously, this, most of you will be aware that PrEP use has been increasing um, fairly dramatically in most jurisdictions. Um, you can see here it's been increasing, but not so much amongst in South Australia and Tasmania, smaller gay and bisexual male populations there, but a very strong rate of increase in New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria, and then this big fall again um, post-COVID, particularly in Queensland. So um, Victoria, which is um, probably the most recent round that we've done you can see here that it's fallen a bit but it's kind of come back up so in the middle here we know from flux that prep use really fell and then it's come back up um in new south wales it's still a little bit depressed or it was when we conducted the survey this is a little bit more fin finesse so it's actually thinking about well who needs to use prep so this is looking at prep use by men who reported condomless sex with casual male partners in the previous six months you can see a higher overall level of use, particularly in the eastern mainland states, rising to over 70% of men reporting condomless sex with casual partners were using PrEP in the pre-COVID period. Lower levels in South Australia and Tasmania, but it's still going up. And again, this um, fall in the post-COVID period. I've continued looking at that indicator uh, by a couple of stratifications. So this is actually looking at what we colloquially refer, refer to as gay suburbs. Uh, so suburbs which have got a high proportion of gay male residents, over 10% or less than 10%. Um, and for New South Wales and Victoria, and this is uh, the two jurisdictions where it's kind of meaningful to look at this, those suburbs tend to be in inner city areas of Sydney and Melbourne. You can, what's kind of interesting here is that actually PrEP use by men who had condomless sex has actually continued to go up and has uh, breached 80% in those um, inner city gay friendly suburbs um, in New South Wales and Victoria, but you can see it has remained suppressed in the rest of the state. And this is geographically, this is the majority of New South Wales, Victoria. So that's kind of interesting. We know that PrEP uptake was driven um, in, in Sydney and Melbourne in these suburbs and it's continued to go up there. Same indicator again, PrEP use by men reporting condom sex with casual partners, but by uh, sexual orientation, comparing gay men, gay identified participants with bisexual and other participants. Um, the bisexual and other identified participants are on the dotted line. You can see that PrEP use was lower generally among them and it fell more among them in the post-COVID period. It was sustained among gay identified participants in the uh, New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria. Okay, and uh, the final indicator, which may have some stratifications, I can't quite remember at this point, is um, negative and untested men who reported condomless sex with casual partners but weren't using PrEP. So these are the at-risk participants who we pay a lot of attention to, the ones we're trying to engage and increase levels of protection. As PrEP use was rolling out across the country, this at-risk group, so those of you who've seen me present on the rainbow slide, we sometimes refer to this as the men in red, uh, was getting smaller in most jurisdictions because protection was going up. Um, that's generally been okay. Um, that's remained the case in Tasmania, so risk has not kind of increased. And South Australia, uh, as well, it's kind of been stable, but in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, the at-risk group got slightly larger in the post-COVID period. So there's a slight increase in the proportion of men reporting condomless sex that isn't protected by PrEP or treatment prevention. Okay, I'm looking at time, so this seems to be about the right point. In summary, um, we did successfully adapt the periodic surveys to COVID-19 with help from our local partners and 
reassuring us that we could demonstrate flexibility in the system and respond to the current situation. It's clear that online, online recruitment has affected our sampling, so it's something we're going to have to bear in mind in our reporting and we're kind of working on publications at the moment. Most of the samples uh, reported fewer partners, which is consistent with Flux and other studies. Reason the higher frequency HIV testing fell, as you might expect, as people stay, had less sex and stayed away from ser services, but it was con this fall was concentrated in among younger participants in all jurisdictions and, and Asian born men in Queensland. HIV treatment was sustained at very high levels, which was good. We observed PrEP use falling in the eastern mainland states, perhaps where uh, PrEP uptake had, had been highest. Um, it also fell in suburbs with fewer than 10% gay male residents and among bisexual participants as well. However, PrEP coverage um, during condomless sex seems to have uh, increased a little bit more in um, suburbs in New South Wales and Victoria with a higher proportion of gay residents. So at the time we were collecting this data, maybe the recovery was underway in those locations. I wonder what it looks like now in New South, in New South Wales. Um, despite some of these changes, we actually saw that the proportion of reporting unsafe condomless sex increased a little bit in most jurisdictions after COVID-19. So that's something one needs to pay attention to. And of course, we're anticipating further changes as COVID-19 continues which I've reiterated here because I'm thinking about it a lot. Um, one of the other things to note is that we're also going to a phase in the project where we're seeking to actually engage some of these groups that I identified, like bisexual and heterosexual, men of sex with men, Asian born participants, younger guys uh, over the next five year period. But we're going to have to do that as COVID-19 effects continue. And this means that there's going to be an ongoing balancing act between maintaining continuity and adapting to change in the system hence my crystal ball. And I'd just like to acknowledge the many, many people who uh, make the periodic surveys possible. Possible. I've introduced the research team. We have many community partners without whom we could not do this research. Funding from uh, federal and state health departments. Special thanks to some of our community partners who helped us adjust the system in these last rounds. And you can find all our recent publications on the CSRH website. Thanks very much. Over to you, Ben. You're on mute. Sorry, I'm on mute. Great. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> that was uh, really great. Um, thanks very much. We, you really tore through that, so we've actually got uh, plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, it's quite tricky to untangle some of those effects because when we look at uh, all those different things that are going on, some things are going up in some groups, they're going down in others. It's really quite hard to pass sometimes. Um, a couple of questions I had just before we'll jump to the um, any Q&A and please people put your questions in the Q&A. Um, so do we think that that increase in the proportion who were unprotected condomless anal intercourse was driven by the drop in prep use? Is that the thing that drove that? Yes, so and I don't know whether you're referring are we just doing video now or referring to the slides as well? I'm looking at the slides for reference, but I can stop sharing those as well if that helps. Um, and I apologize for um, rushing through this so quickly. To give you some context, I had to re record a 10 minute version of this for a conference recently. So I've kind of quite got, got quite good at rattling through the um, indicators. Um, yeah, my understanding would be that the decline in the proportion of at-risk participants over the last few years has been driven in particular by the increase in PrEP use. So I think for those of you who followed PrEP rollout among gay and bisexual men recently, um, initially the increase in PrEP use was accompanied by a bit of a drop in condom use, and so there wasn't really that much change in the unprotected group. And then as PrEP use picked up pace, we actually saw that at-risk group getting smaller. Um, and, you know, when we, we published recently on that saying, you know, back in 2019, it looked very much like it had declined across the country. Um, what I noticed putting this together is showing these trends by different jurisdictions. You can see there's quite, there's quite varying levels of uptake uh, and coverage. Um, but it, yeah, this was interesting to see that you could see the at-risk uh, group getting smaller as PrEP rollout 
um, proceeded, and I, th I think we think that's generally why it got smaller. And then in this COVID period, I think where we've got some people who stopped using PrEP, um, overall people are saying they're having less sex, but it looks like we've picked up a group of people who have perhaps gone back to having sex or continued having sex, but aren't uh, as well protected as they were as they were before. I mean, I, I suppose one of the things that with these data is that they're relative proportions as well. So prep use falls in the sample, and then a group of people continue having sex. They could end up looking like a bigger group um, if they, you know, they'd never engaged uh, with prep, for example. Um, you would imagine that those participants actually have fewer partners um, you know, at yeah. the moment during the COVID period. Yeah, and that issue of relative percent was the other thing I wanted to pick up on. So um, in that the number of casual partners decreased overall. So the number of people who are in this slide that you had on, had on the screen about um, the negative untested participants who reported closely but not on prep. Um, that number is smaller this time, but the percentages, so the percentage of the people having casual sex who are having unprotected casual uh, condomless sex with those partners has gone up within those men, but in the overall sample of men, do you know what's happened there? Because, because it's got the number who had sex with casual partners has got smaller. Um, this is one where I think I may have to palm this one off for one of my glamorous um, colleagues. Um, uh, Curtis, Tim, do you have a sense there? I mean, look, obviously the, the overall numbers have fallen, as I showed you. Um, so the overall number of people reporting casual sex in all of these uh, surveys has fallen. And even when it, where it's sustained, we're assuming the partner numbers are lower. So. And I'm drawing here because we're involved in flux as well. I'm drawing on that, which shows us that people are reporting fewer partner numbers overall. If they do go back to having sex and they're not on prep and they're having common sex, it looks like a few occasions rather than lots of sex. And you would expect that to be the case in the periodics as well. But it did stand out to me. I, I was a bit surprised by that because you would kind of think of the overall level of sex, everybody's kind of drawing back a bit that perhaps that at risk group wouldn't kind of be so wouldn't be so prominent, but maybe the change in the prep use, which was quite marked, has yeah, inflated that proportion. Yeah. Uh, Curtis or Tim, did you wanna add anything? You can just nod to me if you do or just shake your head. Because <laughs> I can see you but no one else can. <laughs> People are like, no, we don't want to take that one. Um, don't give it to us. <laughs> well look I think in general to also kind of um contextualize some of the, the recruitment rounds because Victoria and Sydney this year was recruited quite um, well after the restrictions were had been lifted um, we did see a lot of recovery quite particularly in Victoria I think the recovery from prep um, was a lot higher than expected and hopefully um, we'll we're working on publishing the reports of both of those states soon so you'll see it um, in much more fine detail but yeah um, in terms of the proportion of people who seem to be at risk uh, we, we saw a decrease in, in high partner numbers um, and decrease in casual part of people who report having casual sex, but it wasn't as, as low as, as I had thought. So yeah, we've seen yeah. some pretty good recovery, I think. Yeah, and this is why it's so important, I suppose, that the way Martin presented those slides was um, really showing the timing in a bit more detail than just the years. So you could all actually see which part of the year each round of these surveys happened in because it really things were just all so different around the country. So this is something that we as a GCPS team is gonna have to deal with now for the next 10 years of writing papers and try to account for all this weird and wacky stuff that happens over this period. So I'll jump to some of the Q&A from the participants. Um, so uh, we've, let's have a bit of a dive, Martin, into the whole question of languages and um, kind of the translation and all that kind of thing. So the question specifically, is did you have the survey in different languages that you advertised in? But maybe you could just talk a bit more broadly about what we did specifically in New South Wales, but also more broadly in the JCPS with other yeah. languages. Thanks. Yep, sure. So, um, and just some apologies to our state partners. Some of you <laughs> spent a lot of time helping us adjust, and I'll acknowledge that here. But I suddenly realised, and of course my cat had to join us at that point, um, 
I suddenly realised, of course, that I couldn't go through every single jurisdiction specifically about what they did because it was slightly different everywhere. But like, there were a lot of meetings. Um, just to confirm for everyone, the um, periodics are available. The online version of the questionnaire. One of the advantages of driving everyone online is that it's available in priority languages already. But I will freely admit that we don't typically do. Uh, any specific advertising in language. So it's more if someone has made it to the website um, and they would prefer to fill it out in one of the languages that's available, um, like simplified Chinese or Thai or something like that, they can switch the online questionnaire into that language. So in most of these jurisdictions, we didn't do any specific uh, advertising to migrant groups or in language. The one exception is New South Wales, where we had quite a long. Um, we decided to keep online recruitment going and trial um, some of our Facebook advertising in, I believe it was simplified Chinese and Thai. I think that's right. Yeah. Just two languages just to see if it, it would work. And we think it did a bit like we think it kind of boosted participation a, lit, a bit over a few days. Um, all the rest, you know, people who choose to fill in the questionnaire in another language, um, it's entirely up to them when they get to the website. And I think, you know, Tim, Tim you can correct me after this, but um, it's a, usually a relatively small group who fill it in. However, we've kind of committed to making the questionnaire available in language because we want to boost that participation going forward. And so that's one of the things we're planning to do with the NHMRC funding. But we'll, I'll freely admit that it's not been, um, um, we've kind of laid the groundwork to be able to do it and we're committing to keep the questionnaire translated, but it's not a, it's not traditionally been a massive part of our recruitment. And in COVID-19, there were kind of enough things going on where we thought, we just need to kind of sustain numbers as best we can. On the second thing, what do we do? Well, as I mentioned, we kind of, some states and territories were better positioned than others to um, pick up online recruitment. So for some, we just did it because that's traditionally what we've done. And local capacity, you know, it would have put a significant burden on some of the smaller organ organizations we work with. With some of the, um, larger organisations, we negotiated what we would do, like whether they, uh, and if possible, we got our local community partners to design local advertising and messaging to put out, um, saying like put, putting posters up in venues and events, saying it's gone online, it's not happening here. Um, if partners had relationships with sex seeking sites and apps like Grindr and Scruff and so on, we, um, ask them to place ads on our behalf. We agreed the content and they placed them. It's often easier for community organisations to do that because they advertise regularly through those platforms. But again, it depends on the scale of the organisation. So the Thorn Harbour Healths and the Acons of this world can do that. Uh, some of the smaller organisations, it would be expensive and um, not so easy for them to do it. But I think we're hoping that we can do that everywhere as we go forward now, particularly with the NHMRC funding. Um, and also, if organisations had a very big online presence, and this goes for some of the um, NAPWA member organisations as well, so if they had an on online network or a health promotion platform, um, which they delivered messaging through, we said, you know, it's up to you, it's based on your local agreements and permission whether you can use this to ad advertise the periodic survey, but if you can run adverts through your health promotion platform as well. So um, that certainly happened in New South Wales and Victoria, and I believe our community partners, you know, were putting messaging out through their online networks. So I know a number of our NAPWA members were messaging their members through newsletters and uh, online messaging and so, so on, and encouraging positive people to take part. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so it is, I'll get to these other questions in a second, but it really is pretty astounding, particularly in the three big states, I suppose, that the numbers that we managed to achieve. Um, and you just listed everything that you said there, but we're not sure, 100% sure about this, but we believe in the GCPS team that this is likely to be some of the largest online samples um, ever conducted in Australia for gay and bisexual men. So we, I mean, getting whatever it was, like 
two two thousand something responses to in New South Wales. That's possibly one of the largest online samples that's ever been achieved. And it, again, a huge thank you to all the community organisations that really helped support all that, plus the work that we did as well. Yeah, so actually I forgot to mention that, that was terrible when I looked at the sample site. So I just was highlighting the drop and that echoed what some of the community partners who used to their big samples said. And then I would be the one coming in going, yes, but this is the most people we've, most gamosexual men we've recruited online in one go in your ju jurisdiction ever. Um, and that started back in Queensland, like, you know, where we just weren't sure what was going to happen and we got the largest online sample there and then we've echoed it in the other jurisdictions following that. But of course, I know it makes the community partners nervous when they're used to being able to go, we've got 3,000 participants in here. We can run any, you, they can ask us to run any analysis on that. And, you know, when it drops by a third, they're like, mm, it's been a bad round, but actually 2,000 participants for most national studies of gay and bisexual men, you know, is a really large sample. Yeah. So I'll jump to one of these next questions. So um, this goes back to the thing we were just talking about, which is relevant to the slide that's on the screen about uh, condom or sanal intercourse in those not covered by PrEP. So Ty asks, do you think we that having a larger number of participants from regional New South Wales or perhaps regional Australia in this year's survey has impacted the increase we that we see in those men participating in uh, condom sex not covered by PrEP? Yeah, so that's a uh, thanks Ty. So that's a good question. Let's just go back. I can't quite remember what the change was. And um, Curtis and Tim may know more than me. We did quite a we did quite a bit of digging here, but it's not been super finesse. So you can see here, for example, like say in New South Wales, the proportion recruited in the metropolitan area fell from 88 to 70 percent. Um, so still majority being recruited from the Sydney metro area by quite a long way, even though it fell. Um, I guess one of the things here is to be cautious about where those regional participants come from, if we want to call them that, because um, some of them may be from just outside the greater Sydney area rather than way out in regional centres. Um, but sure, like the drop in um, Sydney Metro men may have affected some of the things we've seen. Um, and obviously that I, I should fully acknowledge that I didn't ask, um, although I looked at the gay suburbs thing, I did, we didn't look at Sydney Metro versus regional um, yeah. in the stratifications. And that might be something that we should take on notice and have a look at. Often when we've looked, Regional, this often can be some slightly odd differences between regional participant, regional residents and city residents. So often the level of risk, it tends to be a bit lower. But um, things like in regional centres, level of testing and so on can be similar. It sort of depends where you look. So um, yeah, good comment. Yeah, I can't tell you without lots of digging. Um, I suppose I should flag without creating enormous amounts of work for Tim and Curtis running into them that New South, New South Wales and Victoria, this is the first time we've shown some of these findings publicly. We haven't done the detailed feedback for each jurisdiction. We're expecting people to ask us to look at things in a lot of depth. Um, we're anticipating um, looking at some of these stratifications, the, the ones that are relevant for each region, um, uh, each state. You know, so some of them may not be relevant in all of these jurisdictions, but you know, New South Wales, we're interested in the gay suburbs, residential location thing. Um, country, um, Asian born men is a focus in more than one jurisdiction at the moment. So, you know, we'll take that through to the um, preparation for the feedback that we're doing. Yeah, thanks for that. So another question now from Steve. So he says, thank you, Martin. Um, so He's wondering the GCPS data may or may not be able to speak to this, but do you have a general sense and maybe from some of your other studies as well of the proportion of people who've changed to on-demand prep during COVID restrictions in comparison to those who just stopped? Yeah, so I'm dredging this out of memory. So Curtis and Tim, if you want to correct me, tell me, but yeah, it's gone up and it's gone up quite a bit. Um, I don't have the draft Sydney or Melbourne report in front of me. So if one of the others wants to pull it from one of those. Yep. Um, um, Curtis, go ahead. So, uh, so in 2020 in Sydney and Melbourne, it was about, bit just about 10%, um, but in this year it's 
closer to 17 to 20 percent for both of those states. So um, nearly nearly doubled. Great. And this um, is among people who, who report some prep use in the last six months. Great. Thanks, Curtis. And uh, thanks, Steve, because obviously we were expecting, for a combination of reasons, we were expecting a rise in on-demand use. It's been going up a little bit over time. And then post-COVID, I think all of us on the team and other people were expecting it to go up more. And obviously in some jurisdictions, um, talking to the community about different dos dosing methods has been encouraged by COVID because we were aware that uh, prep use had been interrupted or paused during COVID restrictions and that some people were deciding that they could perhaps take prep less often and were therefore more confident trying on demand. But yeah, it's definitely gone up in the last year and we're probably be interesting to see what happens now around the country as well, whether we get the same pattern because you'll have seen in some of those um, you know, when we were looking at the prep use, and it didn't, hadn't really stood out to me before. It has a little bit when um, I've done feedback in different jurisdictions, but you know, that the level of prep use varies quite a lot across the country. Yeah. And therefore, you, mentally, you could go, well, obviously in the States with the highest levels of use, you could probably see, you see the kind of most effect of COVID uh, and changes in sexual behavior, but in the, um, less populous jurisdictions, you know, you see lower levels of prep use overall, and in most cases it appears to have been sustained uh, in the last two year period. So quite a lot of variability there. Yeah. And the other thing just to mention about on demand that was happening around the same time was um, the really large scale community based education campaigns that really endorsed fully went there and endorsed on demand prep really for the first time at a large scale. There's been smaller campaigns, but at a large scale also happened over this period of summer where we were particularly recruited the New South Wales data and then later the Victoria data. Um, and prior to that, I think a lot of the community organizations hadn't gone very hard on this because we were, everyone was still waiting for the endorsement of uh, the federal government or whoever this committee is that needed to endorse the new ASHRAM prep guidelines that said that on-demand prep was now supported in Australia. <clears throat> and it, so the guidelines came out in 2019, but it took quite a long time for them to be endorsed. And then most people, including doctors, didn't really want to go hard on on-demand until they'd been fully endorsed by whatever committee makes that endorsement. And that did happen in kind of late 2020. So then we've seen a big change there too. I suppose just or just to add to that, though, on my perspective, thinking about Flux, because I'm sort of paying homage to Garrett Moe and the team that kind of scrambled to follow a group of gay and bisexual men through the epidemic last year, is that um, I think we saw lots of prep users vote with their feet last year. You know, they decided to stop sex or restrict yeah. it to a small number of people, just their primary partner, interrupt taking prep and then they kind of decided for themselves, okay, if I gradually go back to having casual sex, maybe not as much as I used to have, I'll take prep around the time of sex or for a limited period rather than taking it all the time. And you know, in Victoria, they would have been proven right because it's something they would send back home. And now in New South Wales, it'll be interesting to see. I think there's a whole other thing here about COVID and vaccination, which I think is the next thing to get our heads around, which is, mm as more people get vaccinated, there aren't that many of us at the moment, um, but as more people get vaccinated, I think it will be reasonable for some people to go, it's okay for me to be dating and having sex again, you know, which let's face it has never been completely banned, even if it was discouraged. Um, and I think you will see a combination there of people going, no, it makes more sense for me to be on prep now because I'm vaccinated, I don't pose a COVID risk to my partners and so on, you know. Yeah, definitely. So one more question here um, from Clara. So, um, sorry, it's just gone off my screen. Um, so did you find it necessary to ask all participants if they identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander? Yeah, so yes, we did ask. And my understanding is the proportion is pretty stable at around three or 4% nationally. Usually um, that's roughly what you'd expect it to be nationally. Um, as you'll be aware, because this isn't Aboriginal controlled research, we collect it because we want to know, obviously, because um, we want, want to acknowledge Abor Aboriginal participants in the survey, but we don't necessarily focus on them as a group because then we would need Aboriginal oversight, I think, 
would be the appropriate way to do it, to go, well, what questions are we asking of those guys in the sample and what's going on? We have done that historically, like we've worked with James Ward and his colleagues and Anukana, um, as then was, to do an analysis of Aboriginal participants um, and um, non-Aboriginal participants. Show, you know, but that's quite a long time ago now. And it is something we have on our list, which is like periodically working with our Aboriginal colleagues, we could look at the specific practices of Aboriginal participants, but we didn't in this case. Uh, and I didn't hear for this particular analysis. But yes, we do ask that along with a few, a number of other things about people's uh, backgrounds and identities as, as well. Yeah. So that's, um, there's no more questions from the audience, but I guess um, one thing that I just thought we might finish off with, Martin, might just be uh, to, if you, if there's anything more you'd like to say about um, our new grant and the kinds of things that we're preparing and thinking about, not that we've got anything set in stone, I'll say that up front, but just that we're thinking about over the next five years about the, G the GPS system and the kinds of changes we want to bring in and the, <coughs> the, and the specific little research projects we're considering as part of that. Yeah, so I suppose, um, Thank you for the invitation to Spruik, the study we haven't done yet. Um, yeah, look, I suppose the the funding is, is welcome. We've been talking a lot over the last few years nationally about responding to changes in the epidemic. And so some of the groups I've mentioned here have risen in prominence in our thinking, and we're concerned that uh, to maintain the system's relevance. And I'd like to kind of, you know, say that we've done a pretty good job and we want to be able to continue to furnish the information to our partners that's been so useful throughout the epidemic and particularly during uh, the adoption of HIV treatment as prevention, new testing methods, PrEP and all the rest of it. So we want to continue to recruit the core group that we've engaged, but we can see here for the system to be responsive, we also have to um, have potentially increase the participation of participants who are at higher risk or remain at risk or are less well protected, whichever way you want to put it. And so that could be people who don't, who's in, who, for whom English isn't their primary language, recent arrivals, um, bisexual participants and heterosexual men who have sex with men. I think there's kind of a, there's two type, I have, there are two main strategies here. We can increase participation in this system, which is very gay focused, and that is potentially limitation and off-putting. So I think we're thinking building a bespoke kind of uh, survey or study for bisexual and heterosexual men who have sex with men would potentially be more appropriate, uh, as well as doing things like actually checking about sex with women and other partners uh, among gay men, which we started doing from this year. Um, yeah, we're hoping to get at this from a range. Uh, and I actually think, I suppose, looking back on the last year that we've demonstrated that, with a rather unexpected shock to the system, we can adjust successfully and keep things going in order to provide that continuity and that reporting, but also to try and think what might, may happen next. I've mentioned COVID vaccination, so I'm assuming as we go into next year that we will need to check how that's affecting things. Um, these other tests to the system, uh, extensions to the system, we're gonna have to gradually introduce and see what happens. Um, trying to make sense of how much sampling and COVID and everything else has affected um, the indicators we've collected is an ongoing challenge. But I think as long as we're up front about the things we know that have changed, people can, can draw their own conclusions about um, what's going on in there, I hope. Um, and I suppose at the moment there's kind of a bit, of, I, think, I sense there's a bit of uncertainty about whether COVID presents an opportunity for HIV in a kind of a virtual elimination agenda. Like, you know, is this the opportunity to help um, further suppress transmission in Australia building on recent success? I think the data I've shown you today suggests there are some potential problems there because as people are wrestling with the stress and the difficulty of COVID, perhaps HIV and sexual health is not their priority, understandably, and therefore you can see kind of mixed outcomes in the data. But I guess what's reassuring me is that we can identify those things in here. And that's one of the values of this system, which is like, look, you're getting recovery in some groups, not others. Maybe we need to focus some attention here 
to support, you know, the best prevention, um, testing and care outcomes that we can uh, among gay and bisexual men. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for the questions and your engagement. It's good to see that there's sort of about 50 of you still here. So that's great. Um, I might just finish off by uh, saying we've got a couple of conferences coming up. So the IAS conference is actually happening next week and we've got a GCPS abstract there. And we've got a couple of GCPS abstracts that will be <clears throat> presented at the later ASHAM conference later this year. So if you're attending those, look out for our work. Um, we're always publishing from these data as well. So um, there's like a sort of steady stream of papers that kind of come out of these um, this study over time. Um, and thanks very much for coming along today.